All right, welcome everyone to our spring 2020 webinar on open pedagogy with faculty and students brought to you by the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, part of Open Education Global. Uh, we have a great uh, lineup for you today with a number of practitioners of open pedagogy, uh, exploring different approaches to the engagement between faculty and students in ways that engage students in learning opportunities that go beyond the board boundaries of the classroom and engage them in the curation and contribution to global knowledge. We'll start with some introductions, uh, talk a little tiny, tiny bit about CCC OER, what we do, and then we'll get into our special guests today. Our special guests here, um, I'll just give each of you a very quick opportunity to um, introduce yourself and just say your name and where you're from if you want. Um, go ahead, Jessica. Hello, I'm Jessica Parsons, and I'm an OER specialist at Paradise Valley Community College in Arizona. Excellent, thank you. And David, um, did you want to go ahead and introduce yourself as well, since you will be speaking briefly? Sure, my name is David Dwork uh, from Paradise Valley Community College, and I am math faculty and the chair of the OER committee for our, our college. Excellent, thank you. And Karen? Hi, I'm Karen Cancellosi. I'm a professor of biology at Keene State College in New Hampshire and also the Open Education Faculty Fellow there. Great, thank you. And then Zev? Hi, I'm Zev Kossin. I'm a, an archaeologist and a faculty member at Montgomery College in Rockville in Germantown. Excellent. And Eduardo, did you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. My name is Eduardo Chavez. I'm an international student uh, currently in Montgomery College, Maryland, in the Rockville campus, and I am uh, working with uh, Seth Cosen. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, before we get started with the discussion about open pedagogy today, I just wanted to briefly remind everybody what CCC OER is all about. As I mentioned earlier, we're part of the larger um, open education global network, um, uh, an organization that Spans the globe supporting open education. Community College Consortium for OER is primarily a North American um, node of the larger OE Global. Um, our goal is to expand awareness and access to high quality content. Uh, OER uh, providing support for a lot of our members and also those who are not members. Uh, many, many people who are not necessarily members of CCC OER benefit greatly from uh, the website that we have or our community email which you can sign up on at the website. We also try to do our best to help lead or help um, leaders of open, in open education uh, do their work. Um, it's not ourselves the leaders, it's really just a network of folks who try to get together to support uh, open education work across uh, the network. And ultimately the whole goal of everything that we do, as you probably would have guessed, is student success. In the end, that's what we're looking for. We also just want to remind everybody, if you hadn't heard yet, that we have put together a website. You can see the URL right there. Uh, the website is an op it's a opportunity for folks to share the extraordinary stories, the, the work that they're doing, and the kind of inspirational work that they're doing during this time of uh, this COVID-19 crisis. And so if you have uh, a story of something that you're doing at your institution, or if there is something that uh, you've heard about, then this is an opportunity for anyone uh, to go out there and go ahead and share the story and, and have it published. There are a few options. You can insert an image, you can um, do a brief description and provide a URL. And we've already got a number of really great inspiring stories about how people are responding in this time when so many people are transitioning to online teaching or remote teaching. Um, and dealing with all of the additional stress and um, challenges brought about by the pandemic. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, just allow our guests to take over here. Um, what you will find, I think, very quickly is that we have a variety of approaches to open pedagogy and this um, kind of innovative way of engaging faculty and students um, and rethinking the learning environment. So at this point, I would like to just go ahead and turn it over to uh, David Dwork and Jessica Parsons from Paradise Valley Community College, which is in my district, the Maricopa Community College District. 
Thank you so much, Matthew. Um, I'm going to jump in. This is David Work. I'm going to jump in and just, again, just introduce myself. Um, my job at the college is the, as the OER chair um, is to help faculty um, adopt OER and, and support them in that, in that process. And we were fortunate enough to find out about the uh, program that College of the Canyons was running about where they were using students um, to help support that. Um, I was lucky enough to approach my administration with this idea and they essentially said, run with it. Um, so I was lucky, we found Jessica Parsons. She was one of our first OER specialists uh, that we were able to hire. And essentially we got, we got her going and got out of the way and she has just run with, the, run with it since then. So, and I'm gonna do that exact same thing. I'm gonna get out of the way and let her take over from here. Jessica? Hello, thank you, David. Can everybody hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Great, thank you. All right, so thank you, David. So let's talk a little bit about what is an OER specialist. So an OER specialist job is to support our content experts or the faculty who have been studying their field um, and are ready to help their students learn without the cost of a traditional textbook. We also help them to verify ADA compliance um, and we're here to help them um, make it OER um, accessible to our busy faculty and just help them to know that there is someone there to act as a research assistant and to assist them in whatever range that they need help with. So our projects range from everything from traditional textbooks to what we call resource banks, which are in our LMS, we use Canvas. Um, they are groups of resources and links um, as well as chapters and textbooks that we've organized to help the teachers teach right out of Canvas instead of having the, the students need to get a physical te textbook. So we've completed quite a few courses and learned a lot along the way. Um, I am a theater major as well as a web design major. So um, to me, one of the greatest things about this is the ability to learn um, lessons and learn from classes that I wouldn't otherwise normally be able to take. And then we're currently working on quite a few projects. Um, I will say that COVID-19 has um, slowed our progress a little bit, but I am still um, looking at having all of these available in fall of this, uh, this upcoming fall, fall of 2020. So we're gonna work hard and I know the teachers are really um, excited to keep going with all of these projects. Now our impact, we have been working since the end of March of 2019. So in our first couple of projects, we were just kind of working to get a feel for what are the faculty interested in and what, um, what opportunities are there as we're learning. Um, and our first live semester where we introduced uh, five different um, five different projects, we were able to save students about $26,000. The following um, spring 2020 semester, this semester, um, our total savings to students is about $43,000, a little closer to 44. So that $70,000 over the two semesters that we've published um, textbooks and resources for our students has really brought an awareness to students that there are options out there. Many of them are taking OER classes for the first time and are beginning to ask other teachers, can, is there an OER option for you? Um, we've also done outreach programs where we've encouraged and sort of taught our students how to enroll in and find OER classes. And that has helped quite a bit, not only to bring awareness to the fact that students can save money, but also bring awareness to our faculty members and how they will be able to um, encourage them to maybe adopt OER, whether it's a full course or simply just resources. 
um, it's really helped us. And we did a survey um, at our college and found that 70% of part-time and 60% of full-time students struggle to pay for textbooks or simply just skip them. So this impact that we're seeing is actually having an effect on enrollment, especially for these classes that aren't necessarily required for most majors. So I thought I would share a little bit about me. So before I became an OER specialist, I was a homeschool student. I completed homeschool from kindergarten all the way through high school. Um, and one of the things that that really taught me was this idea of sort of the patchwork quilt way of building a curriculum. My mother was my primary teacher and she would um, give my sister and I multiple resources as we were learning and we would sort of bring them together to create a more comprehensive curriculum. Um, so I feel as an OER specialist that has really helped to set me up for success. A lot of what we do is also, as many of you know, through licensing, asking for permissions and understanding what we can and cannot legally use. Um, and I actually was first introduced to that through a Photoshop course that I took. Um, one of the lessons was dedicated to learning about different licensing and the Creative Commons was um, covered in that. And that was sort of a first eye-opening moment for me that there are all of these different licenses out there. Um, and then also a love of research. I was always the kind of student who, if you asked for a five page paper, I'd probably give you about six or seven pages and then probably two more pages of resources at the end. <laughs> so having that experience and having just that love of research and that love of continually learning things really helped me to grow and to, um, I feel, be successful in this position. Um, we recently just hired another OER specialist um, to help us out and we're working to grow the program. Multiple colleges are now looking to adopt the College of the Canyon model as well. So um, there are definitely some lessons that we've learned from our first projects. Um, we tend to work a semester or two ahead simply because we want to make sure that we have enough time to complete everything. And really it's not about the full course. It is about finding the resources needed to um, support what the faculty are already using. So often faculty are overwhelmed by the idea of um, working on an entire course over the course of a month, a couple of months or a semester, working to build up from the ground up um, a course. And it's not about the full course. We've there have been so many opportunities that we've had to simply supplement a course or to help a faculty member um, with a resource that wasn't quite working for them and help to kind of introduce them in that way to OER. Um, so, and we also, following up with faculty constantly, um, we're in constant communication with faculty who are, we are currently working on projects with, as well as those who we've completed projects for. Um, there's always opportunities for these courses to grow and evolve and to, to change as well. Um, another thing that I've, we've also learned is always asking about copyrighted content. We've actually been very surprised. A lot of um, big companies and creators and publishers are sometimes willing to allow us to use their resources in the OER realm as well. So, um, and of course, there's always room for rewrites. There have been several courses that we have rolled out one, um, one semester, and then we've started to look at how the students are responding to them, and we're making adjustments. Um, and ne next semester, we're actually going to be doing quite a few tweaks along the way just to make sure that we're polishing these courses and that they're relevant and ready for these students. Um, and then we save absolutely everything that we find. We try and save everything so that um, we can continue to share resources. Because as a student, one of the things that I've noticed is as I'm going through my different courses, I've found that the same topics or the same ideas pop up in multiple courses in multiple disciplines. So sometimes those lessons can be shared to create more of a, a, a continuity for the student along their degree path. Um, and then also keep talking about OER really we're our best advocates, those who use OER and teach from OER. 
um, we're the ones who are out there on the front lines, if you will, and we're the ones who need to keep talking about OER. That's the only way that it'll get out there. So thank you so much. Hi, I guess I'm next. <laughs> um, hey, Liz, is it okay if I share my video? Guess I'm just I'm just gonna do it. I'm just yeah, gonna I have no it. problem with you doing that. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, I just I wanted to do that because I wanted to start a little bit um, before I get into the slides, just to talk a little bit about how I am struck at this moment about the, how the COVID crisis is really a moment for open pedagogy. And um, obviously there's a lot of negative aspects to this crisis and I'm not trying to pretend that there's not, but, but if there's any little tiny bit of silver lining, it's the ways in which um, open pedagogy has emphasized some of the things that some of us have been doing that others are starting to realize, oh yeah, maybe some of this stuff is important. What's really been interesting is that when we've been forced to sort of suddenly teach online, um, that it's kind of created a kind of triage. Like we have to ask ourselves, what is most essential to us as instructors? What is it that we really need to keep? I, I'm really fascinated by the fact that a lot of institutions just said, let's just drop grading, that can go, right? Let's focus on our students, on supporting our students. Let's focus on how our students can really be uh, able to be successful in this new environment. And so we're actually examining how issues of access are affecting our learners, something that those of us in the open education movement have been talking about for quite a while, talking about access. We've also talked about looking at ways that students can help us design our courses, right? To say, how do we center student agency in our, in our classes? And, and we've talked about how social justice is absolutely integral to our discussions of open pedagogy and now is an opportune time for us to be addressing anti-asian behavior that we're seeing around our country and around the world this is something we can do in our classrooms <clears throat> and so let me just kind of go on to this slide if i can get there my buttons are not advancing the slides <laughs> Maybe we should have had that practice, Matthew. Yeah, you've got you've got control, so you should be able to. There we go. It was just a little bit slow. Try one more time. No. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> of course, we practiced this, and now it's not working. So go ahead and um, request the uh, remote control. Okay. Maybe that was all my problem. Okay. Sorry. No problem. <laughs> Error. All okay. right, this is great. Okay, here we go. So I want to talk about what open pedagogy is. If I could just get that next slide up, I'd be really happy. There we go, yay. Okay, sorry folks, I really, really apologize for the delay here, but um, yeah. so I'm well, back. Now, now that you've got this all worked out, uh, <laughs> just you tell me and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll put the next slide through, okay? Okay, let's just go with this slide for now. And so, um, what I wanted to put here was talking about how these essential elements of open pedagogy that I was just talking about, a slide that I've used a lot in different forms in the past, where we're talking about emphasizing community and collaboration over the content of our courses, in our, within our courses. And, and again, in this crisis, this is something that's really come to the forefront for us, um, connecting to the wider public, how we can be a resource for others in the community talking about how learners can contribute to not just consume knowledge how do our students actually contribute knowledge and not just be passive recipients of information <clears throat> and again how students can be driving their own learning processes what is the extent to which giving students agency allowing them to decide what they need best in order to learn and so um, also talking about the critical approach to the use of tools and technology. I don't know how many of you guys out there are getting lots of emails about, oh, buy this ed tech product. Oh, now that we're in this crisis, here's this free version of this material that you can have from us or free software 
only to probably get turned around and, and cost us money later. So we need to be sort of critical about the kinds of technologies that we, that we might be using. And I put the open licenses up here on this slide to remind us that when, when students are creating content, that uh, when we're creating OER, that it's not just faculty that can create OER, but students can do that, and that it's not just about textbooks, right? So we're, we're talking about all the ways in which open pedagogy can really um, bring a lot of revolutionary ways to think about how we can transform our teaching and how we can kind of maybe utilize this moment to, to do that. Uh, so let's try the next slide there, Matthew. Thank you. One of the open pedagogy projects that I've used quite a bit in the past, and we could be talking about a lot of different kinds, um, is the idea of domain of one zone. I don't have to talk about this today because the domain of one zone is, is absolutely um, an important way that students can create openly licensed content of their own by giving them their own little slice of the web where they're able to share the kind of knowledge that they're interested in, where they can um, put an open license on their work, where they can think about their digital identity, where they can learn how to be digitally fluent and engage with others online as we think about them as digital citizens. <clears throat> and so the, and the next slide will um, talk a little bit about, uh, here's an example of a student domain where students are creating the kind of content that, they, that they're interested in getting across to the public. And so the fact that students can have an audience beyond their professor really changes the nature of the kind of work that they want to get out there. <clears throat> and so when we think about how these spaces are not just static places of broadcast, but they can be interactive, where students can comment on each other's work, where the larger community can read what they're doing and they can provide comments back on the work. Um, where it's a space for students to be collaborative, where there can be uh, ways in which students are constantly revising and keeping the work dynamic, that these kinds of spaces can be these renewable assignments or these non-disposable assignments where the work can live on past the end of the semester if the student wants it to, right? We're talking about giving students opportunities, giving students choices, and not mandating that they be on the web because we don't want to enact um, exploitation. We want to really be able to give our students opportunity. And the next slide is a quote from one of my students. When we talk about changing the audience for our students, uh, one of my students wrote this uh, a, a long time ago. Um, it was a drastic and honestly scary change going from a traditional learning course where I only have my instructor's opinion to worry about. Um, and so when we think about when our students are creating assignments, who are they creating that for? Is it just for you? Are you just going to get a paper that you have to grade and at the end of the semester you hand it back or the student never picks it up and you throw it out? So when students start to think about the value of their work in terms of the audience that they have, it really makes a huge amount of difference. <clears throat> and so on the next slide, I want to show you some other uh, examples of thinking about like Right now in this opportunity, my students are thinking about what they've wanted to contribute. And we've been actually talking a little bit about the coronavirus since February. And then obviously things really ramped up on our campus where a couple of students were writing about the biology, like what is a virus? What is the coronavirus? How does that actually get transmitted to other people? Talking about the epidemiology. And so my, I've just allowed my students to think about what is it that you want to say? What is it that you want to be talking about right now? And so a number of other of my students started to say, yeah, this is, really, this is really what's at the forefront for me. This is what's on my mind right now. And on the next slide, you'll see uh, students talking about how they were starting to feel hopeless. And so we say, how can you contribute to the community and what's your in right now to feel maybe a little bit less hopeless or think about what's going on for other college students. This student put together a variety of resources that maybe help people think a little bit more positive. She talked about vaccine developments that are happening in different parts of the world. Um, and she was talking about antibody testing and other kinds of things that showed a little bit of some of the positive trends that may be happening out there. Not that there aren't negative things that are happening, but it seemed important to her for there to be information that felt a little bit more positive to others. So again, when a student has their own slice of the web where they can just put whatever they want to 
up there and and but at the same time they're learning about the biology they're learning about the statistics of it they're learning a lot of content while they're contributing to their community this is the real essence of open pedagogy um, the next slide is another example of a student contributing here about mental health in particular and um I don't know about many of you, I've spent a lot of time online with my students one-on-one, -on -one, just asking them how their life is going right now. And some of them are just talking about how they feel both overwhelmed and bored at the same time, which, which is really interesting. And I asked my student to kind of write about that. What is it that you're feeling? What is the anxiety that you're feeling? And so when they're talking about this in their online spaces and other students have a, an opportunity to respond and say, yeah, I'm feeling that too. What is it that we can do? Uh, to address that. Um, on the next slide shows an example of a student who is writing about hoarding and bulk buying. Is it really necessary? Like what's going on with that? Why are people doing this? And so there are other examples where students were writing about social distancing and all of the things that have probably been on, on all of our minds, but connecting what's going on currently in the world to ongoing concepts that we've talked about in class, like what is exponential growth and what is um the biology of this epidemic that's happening right now that those connections are really the the value in the in the learning and i think on the next slide if i remember correctly oh i just wanted to put out the the fact that um you don't have to necessarily have a a really fancy rec reclaim hosting domain of one's own project at your campus there are some free tools and i put free in quotes here because um, of course, you can have free versions and then things don't always stay that free or you get ads that can come up. And so we can be a little bit critical about some of these tools. I think of some of these tools as starter tools and then we find ways to um, get around and using more independently designed tools or tools where we can get rid of the ads. But these are good places for students to start as their, their own space for creating a domain. And the, the next slide is talking about how um, one of the ways that students can drive traffic to the sites that they've been creating is to use social media and again another tool like twitter like linkedin not perfect they can be fraught with all kinds of problems but when students know how to leverage social media connections in a way that can really get their ideas and their energy out to the public um, it can be quite powerful and so students here were talking about in, in a twitter chat that we had about what's going on in their classrooms how some they felt some professors were maybe assigning too many three hour lectures and 10 different videos they had to watch and in other classrooms they felt like it was going wonderfully they felt so incredibly supported by their professors <clears throat> and so it was just a really fascinating discussion and by making it public students from other universities um, and a few other people kind of jumped in on this a little bit as well um, so on my last slide, I just want to end with a quote by Robin DeRosa, uh, because it, I think it really highlights what she was talking about when she wrote this a long, long time ago. I've used this quote in some of my other talks. When we're thinking about access, access to knowledge. When, when my students gain access to knowledge, I want it to be part of a larger invitation, right? That we trust that you have important lessons to teach the world. And we trust that the knowledge you're accessing today will be changed by your perspective that you'll open doors to new ideas that we, your current teachers, never could have taught you. And, and I love that idea that what we're doing as teachers is trying to empower our students to learn and share information and to learn things that we don't necessarily even know ourselves right now, that we're not just dumping content on them. So, so I probably went over on my 10 minutes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna end right there and let uh, our next speaker well, well, thank you very much, Karen. I think that that was, I mean, that's really wonderful. And, and so far, I think it's, it's clear, most probably clear to everybody that there is um, a, many different approaches to whatever this thing called open pedagogy is. And, um, and, and all of these examples that you just shared really were um, very inspiring to me. So at this point, I'd like to transition it over to Zev and Eduardo. So um, if you want to control your slides, then just go ahead and request that permission and I will pass it on to you. All right. Thank you very much. Requested access um, and it looks like I have it. 
So thank you very much. And this will be a, a nice transition, particularly in the discussion of renewable assignments and the impact that that can have um, in the classroom. Um, I'm gonna go ahead if I can move these slides along. Which is not happening. Okay, I'll, I'll, I guess I'm gonna have to do it here too. <laughs> That's what we get for rehearsing. Okay, so if you can go one slide back. Okay, perfect. Okay. So um, uh, I'm really um, uh, pleased to, to be able to participate in this um, webinar and just want to thank once again the organizers and, and fellow presenters here. And I'm also really happy to co-present with a former student of mine, Eduardo Chavez, who you'll hear from uh, in just a few minutes. and. Um, I guess the way that we'll approach this is sort of in two parts. I'll start by giving a broad overview of, of one particular method um, of the open pedagogy movement, and that's uh, renewable assignments. So I'll, get, I'll go into a bit more depth um, of that discussion that we just heard. Um, and then uh, Eduardo will then share his experience of actually doing those assignments from a student perspective. And those assignments were specifically created as part of a, a faculty fellowship program at my institution of Montgomery College. I mean, you can see it there on the slide. It has a, a long but um, very informative title of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Open Pedagogy Faculty Fellowship. Um, and so ju just like we heard in the, in the previous presentation, I take open pedagogy to refer to this sort of um, values-based movement Right of and a series of teaching practices that seeks to involve students in these more uh, participatory, inclusive, experiential, uh, more relevant and engaged exercises. Um, and importantly, it's supposed to be learning that's that's student centered um, and also flexible to diverse uh, student abilities, diverse student knowledge and skills. And so that UN SDG project, as I'll as I'll refer to it here. Um, is what provides space to develop that sort of teaching practice, while at the same time, the point of the of the, the fellowship is also to create assignments that could have potential impact in addressing some of the serious crises like those UN Sustainable Development Goals, the, the 17 goals that the UN um, has created. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, You'll see that as an, as an archeologist, I'm accustomed to doing quite a bit of participatory, experiential and hands-on work um, because that's really the foundation of becoming a field archeologist. Right? You need to go to the field and learn to do these things. Um, and so you can see here some former students um, in Ecuador uh, where I run a field project doing um, various activities in the highlands there. Um, but what I, realized was that having that same sort of teaching impact in the classroom, of course, is a whole other um, sort of challenge. Um, so moving on to the next slide, as part of that UN SDG program, um, I was paired with two colleagues from Kwantlen Polytechnic University. And on the next, there we go. Um, you can see I was paired with uh, uh, Kathy Dunster and Michelle Franklin from different disciplines, right? They were from sustainable horticulture and, and urban ecosystems, and I myself an, an, an anthropologist. Um, and so we had to create together a series of these renewable assignments um, that combined our respective disciplines. And those renewable assignments are, um, as, we, as we just heard, they're opposed to the so-called disposable assignments, right? Like a paper or an exam that essentially students sort of throw together and then they turn it in and then maybe the next day or a few days later, they've essentially forgotten everything that they um, just put into it. Um, so ideally a renewable assignment lives beyond the semester of completion. Um, so on the next slide, together we decided to create assignments targeting uh, SDG number two, which you see there, zero hunger, um, which of course, as with all of these goals, um, is really interrelated with several others. And so you can see them highlighted there in blue. Um, and then on the following slide, I'll share uh, two and three, which are the ones that uh, we, we created three assignments, but I deployed two of them. So I'll review those here. Um, and first what we like to refer to as, as a weed bio blitz. 
Um, the key point for this assignment was to um, rethink this category of plants called weeds um, and to consider how they might actually provide readily available sources of nutritious food all around us. Um, and also to consider how some plants are uh, treated and consumed very differently around the world. So what we might consider a weed in our backyards or in the gardens or on our campuses um, in other parts of the world may actually be a really important part of a cultural practice or of um, a local diet. And so this was really important course, which was human evolution and archaeology, because one key point in that story, in the story of human evolution, um, over millions of years is that intimate relationship between humans and our environments or those broader local ecologies. Um, so on the next slide, I'll go into a bit more detail of that assignment. Um, for my classes, on, on my end of this, I decided to do this as an archaeological survey, um, except in instead of searching for ceramics or other sorts of artifacts um, on, on the ground surface, which is what we would do as, as archaeologists, Students were instead looking for weeds around the campus um, and then recording them through this open source app called iNaturalist. And so this way my students got a taste of what pedestrian survey was like, what it was like to actually go out into the field and, and do something like an archaeological survey, while the horticulture students at, at Kwantlen um, were identifying the plants that we recorded. And on the next slide you can see just sort of a screenshot of the iNaturalist app um, which is what uh, we used for this project and what anyone here listening can, can now download and use. Um, if you want to, you know, you're taking a walk and you, you see some amazing looking uh, uh, flower blooming um, with the spring, you just snap a picture of it, submit it, and then the, the broader uh, iNaturalist community will identify it for you. So it's really a nice resource. Um, on the following slide, we, we scaffolded the assignments um, by asking the students to do an ethnobotany. And in my case, I had them do a two-part ethnobotany. Um, you'll hear more about this uh, in a few minutes. Um, but what I asked them to do was to do two things. First, to take a deeper dive into one of those weed species, um, one of the weed species that any of the students had identified on our own campus. Um, and then to research its botanical history and its properties, but also the ways that it could be used um, in edible uh, in edible ways, right? Edible plant or for medicinal purposes, or even in other cultural practices, right? We can think of um, using certain plants as part of rituals or different religious practices. And then part two involved choosing um, really any plant, any plant that students had some sort of personal connection to that student um, and then do the same research and explain what that personal connection was. So the idea there was to not sort of force everyone to be researching the same thing, but actually give the freedom to student, for students to choose their own path, to choose something that was um, of more interest to them. On the following slide, um, uh, I'll say a bit about the challenge of, of trying to integrate renewable assignments into um, already established courses. Right? That's, that's one challenge. Um, and so I tried to do that through at least three ways. So on the next slide, uh, the, you'll see one way that I tried to do this was um, to shift the focus of the class. Right? And so the next couple of slides are, are are taken from my actual uh, lectures that I gave in class, so I won't, I won't actually give you an, an anthropology lecture here. Um, but in this example, I stress the importance of taking the lessons of human, the, the human evolutionary journey um, to reflect on and, and try to think of solutions that we could actually use um, to solving some of the contemporary crises of our own human making today. And part of that was a focus on this idea of the Anthropocene. We go through over millions of years, we go through all different geological epochs. Um, and so the idea here was to focus on um, this, this period of extreme human intervention in, um, in local ecology. Um, the second one, which you see on the slide here, is, uh, was the opportunity to actually teach and experience field methods um, like archaeological pedestrian surveys. So this is a picture not from our campus, um, but actually from Ecuador again. Um, 
on the on the previous slide, you can see students in um, walking transect lines. And so I, I introduced these methods to students in class so that we could actually go out and do them on our own campus. And then the third way I tried to um, integrate this into the course was to um, uh, to make it locally relevant. So in this case, um, the slide with the map, um, you'll see a map of Montgomery County. So the idea was to take this issue of food insecurity, right, which was again, uh, SDG number two, the zero hunger goal that we were addressing, make that locally relevant to the class. So we discussed the statistics regarding food insecurity right here in our own county, right, in, Mon in Montgomery County, as well as at our own college, the, the issue and, um, and some of the, the ways that the college is trying to address food insecurity. Um, and you can also see in the map, um, if you can go to the, the following slide there, uh, with the map of Montgomery County, you can also see, if you know anything about the county, um, it, it leads to discussions about how food insecurity often breaks along racial and ethnic lines. Okay, so, um, if you could move maybe two slides forward now. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, so the challenge was to integrate the events into the course outcomes and then try to gain that student buy-in um, and understanding of the, the, the urgency of the moment. Um, and so uh, uh, it was time to actually deploy them into the class. And so as I wrap up my portion here, I'll just say um, that we had a lot of fun. If you, if you go to the next slide, I ended up dividing the two different courses that I deployed these assignments in. I divided them into survey groups to survey distinct parts of the campus. So here you can see the, uh, the Rockville campus um, in Montgomery County at, at Montgomery College. This is our campus, and so I just divided it into into grids and then um, had students break up into groups and actually survey those as if it was an archeological survey. Um, uh, in the following uh, slide, you can see several photos where students are actually uh, uh, recording the weeds. They're, they're actually uh, going around this, taking pictures of them and submitting them immediately to iNaturalist. And of course, <laughs> you can see some uh, class selfies that we took as we did it. Um, and this is both from the Rockville campus and the Germantown campus. And so in the end, we had created uh, really our own project page, which you can see on the following slide. We had created our own project page in iNaturalist um, with participation from uh, both my classes at Montgomery College and also from the students at Kwantlen um, Polytechnic University. Um, so there you can see all of the observations and that project page is still living. It's still, um, still available and still being added to. Um, additionally, on, on the next slide, you can do all sorts of spatial analyses, statistical analyses. Um, and then I had students um, just respond to some reflection questions in the form of a field journal. Um, and Eduardo will give a brief tip of that um, as well. So let me leave it there and turn it over to Eduardo to describe his experience um, as a student actually going through and doing some of the science. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eduardo Chavez, and I'm here to talk a little about this project as well from a student perspective. Um, I will try to request uh, remote uh, control here. <laughs> Hopefully it will work. But otherwise, let's see. Um, so again, this is an Anthropology 215, uh, the Human Evolution in Archaeology uh, is the name of the class. The SDG that we're working with is Zero Hunger and uh, their renewable assignment, Ethnobotany. And uh, yes, it seems like it might not be working. So I would ask uh, uh, Matthew Bloom if you don't mind uh, going to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so our initial survey uh, took place in Thursday uh, October 24th, 2019. It was uh, 30 minutes. It was only from 11.30 a.m. to 12 p.m., but in that time, we managed to survey quite a lot. Uh, our, the groups were split. Uh, the entire class was split. Uh, the group that I was a part of took Zone 5, which was uh, half the parking lot in uh, the Montgomery, uh, Montgomery College uh, campus in Rockville. Um, 
it was mostly uh, parking lots. There was uh, part of the Robert E. Perilla Performing Arts Center, uh, the Welcome Center, and the athletic fields, which included the baseball field. Uh, we were, I was personally tasked to survey the area outside of the Welcome Center. Uh, next slide, please. The visibility on the ground was high, thankfully, because uh, the grass was cut and maintained, made finding the plants and the weeds very easy to see. Next slide, please. Uh, there were several plants that were growing between the cracks and the pavements and such, as well as many that were growing next to the Welcome Center building itself. Uh, but one that really caught my attention was this small white flower that I found in the trail between the Welcome Center and, the, and Manakee Street, which leads uh, outside of the campus. I took a picture of it and I sent it to iNaturalist and somebody at KPU uh, likely uh, identified it through iNaturalist as an American aster. Uh, the specific species was not made available uh, clear, but I still decided to focus my project on this lone flower that I managed to find. Next slide, please. The American aster itself, um, as I was uh, doing some research on it, I learned that it's a perennial plant, which means that it lo lives longer than two years. Uh, they are flowering plants. Uh, that's how you most easily distinguish them because of their uh, pattern. They kind of look like a uh, star, uh, which relates to the name aster, uh, which is the shape of the flower. Next slide, please. The asters themselves are very common uh, and often seen as garden flowers. Uh, they're small and colorful, which makes them very attractive to a lot of people. Uh, they have been around for several, for a long time, uh, especially in uh, Native American and Chinese uh, medicine, and they have um, also been uh, used uh, to as their leaves have been cooked to serve as greens. Uh, the roots have been used in stews as soups as well. Next slide, please. Um, I found a small recipe on to how to make aster tea which is usually involves uh, cutting the aster during uh, the full bloom in early morning, uh, making sure that you uh, make a precise cut uh, four inches above the soil level. Uh, you would then have to hang it upside down on a dark area. Uh, the, plant, the flower itself becomes white and fluffy and easily crumbable, but it uh, becomes usable as a, for tea. You would then store the dried aster leaves and flowers in a sealed glass container and uh, that can keep up to one year. The important part is being able to use the aster as a tea during that time. Next slide, please. Uh, and for my personal connection plant, I decided to choose the African baobab, the Andansonia digitata. Next slide, please. The African baobab itself is found natively in Africa, and uh, it has a very delicious fruit that a lot of people uh, eat in Africa. Uh, it can grow over 30 meters tall, 20, 25 meters in diameter. It's a very, very large tree. It can live over for 100 years. And there was said to have been a uh, specimen found in South Africa that was carbon dated to 6,000 years old. The baobab itself is uh, derived from the name of, in Arabic, uh, uh father of many seeds. Uh, it was named after Michael Adinson, uh, who is a French naturalist who worked in Senegal, who also said that the baobab is probably the most useful tree in all. Next slide, please. The baobab itself has a lot of cultural significance in a lot of places in Africa. Uh, the baobab can survive prolonged droughts. It can uh, store up to 30,000 gallons of water. Uh, to drink this, Kalahari Bushmen actually use grass straws to be able to uh, penetrate and suck out the water from the trunk, uh, which uh, is a good method for survival. The uh, hollowed out trunks are also really good for storing water by themselves and they're often used to store water for villages. Because of this uh, and because of the fruit, they're often known as the tree of life. The baobab uh, seeds have been discovered in ancient Egyptian tombs, even though they're not native to Egypt, which means that they were traded uh, to the pharaohs and that they enjoyed them enough to be able to be buried with these seeds. Uh, the bark is fire resistant and it's used for making cloth and rope, which is very important in Africa as well. Uh, the leaves are used as condiments and medicines and has been the source of food and income for centuries for a lot of people. Next slide, please. There's also the idea of uh, the baobabs in uh, The Little Prince, but Antoine de saint exupéry I'm sorry if I uh, did not pronounce that right, <laughs> but the idea is that uh, in the story, The Little Prince, the baobab trees symbolize obstacles in life as they start as very small seeds, but can grow very quickly 
and uh, can actually destroy the, pl the small planets that the prince usually lives in, as you can see in this uh, drawing, for example. Um, I read the book back in middle school, and the tree itself resonated a lot with me as there were small problems that could grow bigger. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to give also a little background about myself. I uh, am a international student, and I was born in Venezuela, as well as where I took most of my classes in high school. Uh, while I was there, I worked in the community uh, service for Jardín Botánico de Maracaibo, which is the botanical garden of the city of Maracaibo. Uh, here are a few uh, pictures of it, as well as the location where it's located in Venezuela. Next slide, please. In the uh, garden itself, we have a baobab that was donated by the Royal Botanical Garden in uh, Kew, London in 1983. It's, it is the hallmark of the entire garden. And uh, from this single tree, six others have been planted in the uh, garden itself, and others have been planting around the city. In fact, my father and I, we uh, went to a park, a uh, nearby park, and managed to plant a few of them with the warden support as well. Next slide, please. I was volunteering during this time in 2007 to 2010. Uh, here are a few pictures of uh, the group that I was uh, volunteering with, as well as uh, in the right here, you can see some of the saplings that I was also planting around the botanical garden. So this uh, tree actually had a lot of its significance for me. And uh, just as a small uh, uh, finishing note, here is the baobab fruit uh, and how you can make juice out of it. Uh, it would require a large uh, baobab fruit, uh, water, ice, sugar, uh, honey, or other uh, sweetener. And from one uh, fruit, you can actually make around three servings. It's about cracking the fruit open. It will reveal the chalky meat as it's seen in the first picture there. Uh, this meat has to be removed along with the seeds uh, and put into a bowl, uh, which needs to be uh, left to in water for overnight. Uh, then it, the seeds can be separated from the pulp, and the pulp itself can be put in the blender. Uh, blended for around 30 seconds uh, to make a smoothie like juice, which is actually very tasty. It tastes almost like pear juice uh, and it can be served with ice uh, and sweetened with your sweetener of choice. Uh, one thing to note is that the baobab fruit has around 300 milligrams of vitamin C, which is uh, a very good um, source of vitamin C, five times more than oranges even. It is used to boost uh, immune function, promote younger looking skin and keep energy levels high. And it is often used at, for medicinal purposes in various parts. And yes, the juice itself tastes very nice, like a pulpy uh, pear juice. With that, um, I would like to close out and say that uh, this uh, project itself allowed me to have a very uh, personal connection with not only the aster itself, but also to be able to show the personal connection I had with the African baobab itself. And I feel that in an SDG project such as this, it's good to have that personal connection, not just make it about the society itself, which it is, but it's also supposed to engage a student and it's supposed to make it uh, uh, a connection with them so that they can also identify with this problem. That is the way that I believe that we can actually solve these issues by making them uh, sustainable and also make them uh, specific to each student that they can have a relationship with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo. That was fantastic. I, and the some comments in the chat have also reflected that. I think that um, everybody rushes to the store right now and gets their, their uh, baobab fruits. Uh, there might be a run on them, but um, it does sound delicious. I um, wanted to let everybody know that we do have a few minutes left and um, probably enough time to address one or two questions. A question or two have already been posted in the chat. The first of which uh, I wanted to bring up actually I think back to Karen um, and something about grading, concerns about grading and the different um, ways in which you approach grading with open pedagogy assignments, I think is something that folks who come to open education and come and, and hear about open pedagogy who are new to it are sometimes kind of concerned by that. So I'm wondering, I guess we could start with Karen, but if you um, have any thoughts about what special considerations with respect to grading apply, um, and then of course, um, you know, Zev, if you also uh, might want to respond to that as well as an interpreter, that would be great. So Karen, did you want to say one or two things, follow up kind of on what you had mentioned about grading? 
Yeah, sure. I'm happy to talk about grading. I think that's always one of the first questions I get whenever I do a talk anywhere. And um, I, my point was that it was interesting that grading was something that was first like just off the table when we needed to figure out what we are going to do in, in this crisis situation, that it made us kind of realize like how essential are grades to learning anyway. And I think the, the comment or the question about huh, maybe this will allow us to realize that there are multiple ways in which grading can actually be an inhibitor to learning, where students are worried more about their grades than they are about what it is that they can accomplish and learn from their experiences. And so there's a whole lot more to say about grading. I can put some links in the chat about a lot of people that have been writing about grading. Um, there was a recent webinar by, at Plymouth State University about um, grading or ungrading. Um, and I will, uh, I'll put some of those resources up there, but it, I think it's a perfect moment. Like I said, this is, a, this is an open pedagogy moment in so many ways. And so I would love to see the ungrading movement take off in favor of actually inspiring students to learn. And, and I'll just say one more thing. If there's anybody out there that's really worried about surveilling your students so they don't cheat and they're on zoom and you're watching them you know think about just not doing that anymore <laughs> i don't think we're actually doing our students a service by um really trying to surveil them right now so i'll, I'll stop because i know there's not a lot of time but i'm happy to answer any follow-up to that too well yeah thank you very much karen i think that's a really great comment um zed did you have anything you wanted to add uh, about that from from an uh, instructor's perspective well, I, I agree completely with everything we just heard, and um, and I look forward to also <laughs> to also reading those resources that Karen just mentioned. Um, what I can speak to um, in terms of the way that I handled this um, this last semester, um, it is a challenge because um, at the same time you're trying to give students the option to do this in many different ways, and so I allowed students to do this with PowerPoints or with, um, you know, a pamphlet or a photo story. Um, there's all sorts of, of, of different media that students can use to do this. And so you have to figure out some way um, in terms of the grading process. And oftentimes students really want to know, well, how am I being graded? Um, and so um, I was pretty flexible and um, I sort of laid out the kinds of information that I expected students to be um, including in the projects. Um, but other than that, I really just made it flexible and allowed students to kind of use their own um, creativity uh, for that. Um, I also, I just happened to notice a comment that popped up in the chat and that was um, about library resources. I, I worked with, I asked a, a, um, a librarian from our campus to help um, um, creating a sort of like a list of, of resources that students could consult that would help them in the ethnobotany project. Um, so that was a really helpful resource relying on, on um, other professionals on campus. Um, so the grading was a challenge and, and I do look forward to reading um, those resources that, that Karen was mentioning. Well, thank you very much. I do think we have enough time to give uh, the last word to one of our students who are on the on the webinar today. So I'm wondering, um, Jessica or Eduardo, do you have any thoughts about this ungrading concept from a student's perspective? Um, if I may. Uh... I will go ahead and uh, put in my my input, I suppose. Please do. I believe that the uh, ungrading system is a good idea, and um, I believe that uh, there are a lot of like issues currently with people that, for example, in Montgomery College itself, there are a lot of uh, nursery students that are also working in the uh, health uh, like sector. And because of this uh, current crisis, many of them have uh, had difficulties keeping up with their uh, great work. And uh, for me, I believe that uh, in empathy and in the show of like this being unprecedented times that we are living through, uh, we should probably have a little bit more leniency with the students themselves as they are also dealing with this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I it is one o'clock.
And I think that everyone, thank you so much uh, for joining us here today. Um, this is going, this has been recorded. And so this will be on the website and you can always refer folks to it if you got something out of this. And thank you for, to all of our panelists and thank you to all of our um, guests here today. Um, just as a kind of shameless plug, we do have two more upcoming webinars. So um, keep an eye out for those and mark your calendars, May 6th and June 3rd. And if you have any other questions or, or, or anything like that, you can always go on the community email and see some other information at our website. So again, thank you very much today um, for joining us and I encourage you to join us next time.